dressing uh, appropriately uh, the rest of you well um, <laughs> me included <laughs> And I, think that, very I think there's a steward's inquiry there, Sir David. I think a couple of colleagues have. <laughs> are we good? Um, because yeah, yeah. Is that is that started? Mm -hmm. um, right. Put in your um, uh, declarations. Does anybody want to uh, highlight any changes since the last meeting? No. OK, uh, thank you very much for that. So they are as stated on our website. Um, if we could then come to the minutes of the meeting on the 19th of October. Um, it would help if I open them. Why does the app want to update? Sorry, colleagues. Word in public, that's it. Um, so, um, page one accuracy. The only one on that, Andrew, I think you're not an associate. I think you are a non executive director and yeah. you were in October. So, mm -hmm. I think you're down as an associate. Um, so it probably worth just um we'll making an am amendment um easily done but um uh anything either accuracy or matters arising on page two three four five six seven eight nine <clears throat> ten eleven no OK, can we accept those as a record of um, our meeting in October then? Uh, thank you. Um, and then um, the action log from our public board. Um, any. Um, is it can we have an update, Navina, do you think on the um, reform agenda, the long term plan? Um, it's down here as to be confirmed, but um, I presume given the Chancellor as part of the autumn statement said that um, there will be a long term workforce plan and that will be published in the spring means that we can probably put some dates in there to be aiming towards a spring publication uh, for that rather than uh, to be confirmed. Um, it is in progress, but um, uh, I hope we can be working towards um, uh, March. Um, I hope this is a, a calendar uh, spring rather than a, a government spring. So, so David, should we bring uh, something to the next public board meeting? Um, to to yeah. a, a paper to the next yeah. public board meeting. I'll yeah. do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we might have some clarity then on what the government's intentions are about yes. independent verification, where yes. we stand with Framework 15, Joe. Yes and how a uh, long-term workforce plan and framework 15 might sit together um etc so yeah very good okay um so we then come to um the uh board and committee schedule which is um set out um are there any comments anybody wishes to make on the schedule that we've got. I think we've just uh, included a meeting on the 31st of March. I think that's to formally wind up and close uh, the business of HEE, I suspect. Um, uh, anything you want to add to this, Nicola? No, thank you, Chair. Um, we've got quite a comprehensive schedule now um, and we've got good agenda plans in place for each of the remaining meetings and that final meeting that I put in on the 31st of March for an hour is it's more of a just in case meeting. We yeah. may need it, we may not, but I thought it was better to have the time set aside, yeah. should we? Okay. okay, very good, very good. Um, so that brings us to um, your update, Navina. Um, so over to you. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so colleagues um, will have the written board report alongside the papers for today and uh, the team will be happy to take any questions on all of the issues uh, summarised. Uh, it's been a really busy period in HEE. We've seen lots of progression in several key areas of our work and also working much more closely with our colleagues in NHS England and towards the future of our new organisation. I'm just going to pick out a few key points. Um, it's important to start, I think, with uh, an update on where we are uh, with our preparation for industrial action, um, which begins um, tomorrow. Um, so uh, we are working very closely with partners in all parts of, of the health system at the moment. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult time of year anyway, and this now feels more difficult for many of our colleagues. Um, there are significant pressures for our, our providers, um, and um, we are making sure that we are supporting them um, where they're in the areas where colleagues have voted for industrial action. Um, now, as across HEE, we of course recognise the right of colleagues to take such action, but at, along, alongside the need to ensure patient safety is protected. And uh, we are uh, uh, thankful and grateful for the efforts that providers have uh, uh, put together to identify services that um, were, will be affected and how we will cope with them. Uh, also be bearing in mind where areas where learners and trainees may also be affected. Um, so NHS England is leading the national response um, and um, we and have established an incident management team. Uh, this meets regularly and it's stepped up recently. We are closely linked into that work. So in ATE, we've been looking at the best ways to support the response and provide practical assistance uh, where required. Uh, within HEE, we've set up our own emer emergency planning structures um, and uh, we have regular meetings daily with our deans and uh, our educators across England to track any impact. Um, and uh, there's further detail in the written report. Uh, so may I just take this opportunity to thank all our colleagues in HEE for the continuing commitment and engagement, understanding and focus throughout this period. Um, I do want to say something about the finance update. It's not actually in my report because it's kind of, we, we're keeping track of it um, uh, up to the minute. Uh, we continue to work with the department and NHS England over our funding for 2023-24 and 24-25. These are positive um, discussions. Uh, growth in funding is required to support the growing level of activity in uh, medical and clinical placements and also in our transformation programs. Um, now, whilst our funding is largely a people cost and there are there is uncertainty around the future impact of inflation, as well as decisions over the levels of affordable growth, we and we commit we are committed and as are our partners to resolve this and uh, also to communicate investment plans to our stakeholders as soon as possible. And I have to say our partners and stakeholders have been very understanding um, of the fact that these are ongoing, ongoing discussions. Um, I just want to say something about the cost of living. Um, so it is important to acknowledge that on top of the, this remain uh, the, that we have ongoing pressures on colleagues working in our system and uh, and then the added uncertainty of the cost of living uh, difficulties. Um, so our collective concern for the impact of the cost of living has been uh, having on not uh, especially as we enter winter months uh, and we already offer our own colleagues a range of measures to help uh, HEE colleagues who may be struggling um, and also considering other measures that we can put into place to support them or and and bearing in mind that we're supporting our students trainees and learners as well a few highlights on where we are getting uh with the um some of the progress that we've made uh it's been challenging year for our colleagues in hee because we've been focusing on transition closing down our organization, moving into the new NHS England. But despite that, uh, mm. colleagues have continued to work hard to deliver business as usual at all levels and also, you know, some innovative and uh, work with our partners. Um, we can feel, I think I would like to reassure the board um, and remind ourselves that actually we've, we've delivered some really quite um, 
important numbers uh, of uh, so it's in the report more than 29,000 applicants have been accepted onto places to study nursing uh, we've been able to meet our target uh, for uh, ge general practice training which is you know really important news for our colleagues in general practice and primary care um, we continue to want to you know make sure that we are seeking solutions and in the integrated planning space so working together on the long-term workforce plan which we will bring to the next board meeting so there's a lot of work uh, going on at the moment um, so that's that's a, a, a I think where I will probably stop we have in the report we've got a uh, detail on the transition update on our work I'll take some questions there um, and actually may I just take the opportunity to congratulate um, Wendy Sorry, Wendy, I'm going to embarrass you um, here. Uh, Wendy, who is our Director of Education and Quality and National Direct Medical Director, has been awarded an honorary fellowship at the Royal College's Royal College of Physicians in London. Um, that's that's pretty pretty impressive. So congratulations, Wendy. Thank you. It was a good dinner. Um, very good, uh, Navina. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so let's um, uh, invite questions, comments. Uh, could I suggest we do transition when we've got two transition items, one in uh, the public board, I think, and then one in the private board. So rather than take transition now, Navina, let's uh, wrap, wrap it up at, um, at later on this morning um, in both public and private boards. So uh, I'm I'm not sure what order they came in, but Andrew Morris uh, first and then uh, Andrew Foster, please. Thanks, David. Uh, just two points. One is on uh, the redistrib redistribution of junior doctors. Uh, there was an issue about funding. Has that been resolved now? I I'm assuming it has, but it'd be good to get confirmation of that. And the other is on um, the, the number of GP trainees. Great news there. However, I think we need to do a lot more around the retention agenda. I think the news on pensions is a really positive step forward. And it'd be just good to understand from Navina about the other steps you know, we intend to make around the, the, the retention agenda. Um, because if we don't succeed there, you know, we'll, we'll see big numbers exit potentially. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Do you want to come back on that, Navina? So, yes, I will take the GP question and then I'll ask uh, Callum to give you an update on where we are with the redistribution funding. Um, so absolutely, Andrew, we're very pleased that we've been able to attract more trainees into general practice. Um, and that's uh, in credit to uh, all of our, our work, but also the college and our partners. Uh, you know, so that's really good. Um, there is a piece of work now that we're going into the new NHS England in my other role in in NHS England, uh, working with Amanda Doyle and the primary care team uh, around all the steps that we can take to improve retention. Uh, and absolutely, pensions is one of them, but also listening to them around workload, um, around the extended team um, and, 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 you know, what more we can be done in the whole area of primary care um, and there is quite a lot of work being done also with the Royal College um, and through primary care networks and integrated care systems uh, to look at the detail and I, I, I think picking on what works well and trying to see whether we can replicate and spread those innovations uh, to improve retention but it is definitely a priority for uh, us in the NHSE side uh, of our work. Thank you. Uh, Callum do you want to can you yeah, just very quickly. I, I mean, and, Andrew, yeah, thanks for raising that because we discussed that previously. Uh, I, I understand we, we're waiting for a formal announcement from the Department of Health Social Care around um, what, what exactly, precisely what's been agreed. But I'm pleased to say that we're, eight, from an HCE point of view, we'll be pressing ahead with the, uh, the plans we've set out. Good. Very good. Uh, uh, Andrew Foster. Thanks. Um, could I just ask a question about the the nursing figures? So um, the first item on your report, Navina, talks about there being 56,000 applicants and about 29,000 being accepted. Um, 
I, my, my understanding is that there is still a huge shortfall of nurses. There's something like 47,000 and, and set to rise considerably over the next few years if we do nothing. So I just want to, uh, the rules have changed over the last two years. Can you just confirm that there is actually a cap on the number of nurse, the nurse numbers that can actually be trained? So, I mean, there's, there's, there's about 27,000 more applied than have been appointed we're not in a position to take those extra 27,000. Is that correct? It's your specialist subject, Mark. Uh, my fastest finger first to David. So I kind of press the button. So um, I'll give you the short answer because obviously we've got a, a short time on board, but I could probably do this for two or three hours. So, so the short answer is that there is no theoretical cap on the number of places at university, but there are some constraints in the system. So one of those is um, the uh, number of placements that we can offer available. We've done a lot over the last two or three years to increase them. We provide tar tariff into the system. And we have over the last two or three years increased placements with placement accelerator funding, particularly out of hospital. So the, the number of total places available broadly ranges between 33 to 35,000. The second constraint is actually um, the ability for the university to take the students on. So there's a physical build plus educators requirement, uh, lecturers and other people. So there is no, um, as in the old days for the commissioning, we don't commission now as HE directly the number of places. We actually look at the numbers coming through in recruitment. But of course, actually, if we look at nursing in terms of its conversion rate, around 40, 50 percent is actually much higher as an undergraduate degree than other types of healthcare degree. So we do take broadly a broad range of people with a broad range of, of grading. Now, of course, some people just don't hit the grades required to complete the course. So as we've seen previously, if we raise the number of acceptances above 55, 60 percent, where we took everybody, what you end up doing is increasing the level of attrition from the programme. And what we've got at the moment is quite a stabilised attrition issue at the moment, which is around broadly 14 to 16 percent, which is actually, again, quite low compared to other undergraduate programmes. So it's a composite picture, Andrew, is the short answer. So are we constrained um, by, by, by direct commissioning? No. But do we have constraints in the system that we continue to work on through placement, educators, universities and, and other elements? Then yes. But of course, what I would say is uh, uh, not those that don't go through the undergraduate route actually have other opportunities. So we see really strong demand in registered nursing degree apprentices. We actually have over five and a half thousand in training and the nursing associate, which obviously isn't a registered nurse, but actually we've got over three and a half thousand actually converting from NA to RN currently on programme. Actually, 1500 of those will be completed by by 2024. Um, so uh, what we have is a, a much broader pool of people who are coming into nursing through different routes um, and different approaches, uh, both of which uh, HE kind of fund and, and deliver. Mark, just on, um, just we just developed that a little bit further. So I think that plurality of routes into nursing is um, really, really helpful because, um, you know, having one route in might not suit all the potential candidates for nursing. But is, I don't know, Andrew, whether part of your question was, is there more potential to take more of that uh, 50 odd thousand? Yes, it was, um, yeah. Yeah, through. Um, so your answer is very helpful in actually explaining the system. But, um, you know, is there more that can be done? And if so, what is it that needs to be done to get more of the people that are interested enough to apply? Um, uh, to convert into placement, uh, to convert into uh, people undertaking the courses. Yeah, so 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 we've obviously continued to work with the university sector uh, to work on some of their constraints. So as a good example, we're actually developing a clinical educator strategy at Health Education England alongside our universities because what we need is a pipeline of clinical academics that can feed into in nursing midwifery and AHPs into universities so they're able to expand. That's something we've been doing with the Council of Deans. Um, we continue with placement management systems. So we've got greater clarity across the system to be more focused on the opportunities to do that. I've been quite public in my view around some of the reform of undergraduate programmes, primarily to decongest the number of hour requirements that exist both in nursing midwifery. So we can use that opportunity to, to reduce attrition, deliver better quality, 
but also it provides an opportunity to think about broader hours requirements in placement, which does give us a, a flex opportunity to do that. The other area is to expand outside hospitals is the short answer placements. We pump prime 15 million last year to look at opportunities within social care in particular. Um, we're currently working with um, Deb Sturdy, who's the chief nurse in social care, to look at opportunities. And we're actually looking to fund this year a number of practice educators in social care. All of this needs to be lined up so the universities have confidence that the placement availability is there. They have got the educators to deliver it. Um, and then when the numbers come through in terms of the number of applicants, they can offer firm offers to people um, as they come through. So there is more we can do in the undergraduate space. But I actually would um, say that we need to maximise these other routes, including postgraduate, which is a two year programme, and then obviously all of the apprentice routes. Yeah, yeah, uh, very helpful. Uh, you and I touched on some of this yesterday in a helpful conversation as well. So. Um, I mean, I think the spirit, probably the question from Andrew and my pursuing it further is the more we can do to get some of those people that are expressing an interest uh, to convert into a course, whichever the route it is, um, the the, um, the better that would be, I think. And um, I think your point about encouraging people into other types of placements, be that social care or placements in the community is um, is very, very helpful. Um, uh, Harpreet, you've been waiting patiently. Over to you. Thanks, David. It was just a question, Davina, on the Digital First programme. Obviously, as you know, we did quite a bit of work in that internally, and it's great to see that workshop kick off, uh, especially amongst uh, NHSE, NHSD and HE. I just want to pick up to see if there's plans in place to take that on further as we go into the new organisation, because there were a lot of good, uh, like I said, work there. And if we're looking to build those high performing th teams and, and thinking about the role of digital across organisations, It'll be good to get an understanding of uh, what the plan for that would be. Thank you. Um, David, anybody want to help uh, with that question? But we haven't got Patrick, have we? Um, uh, it was one of the points I was going to raise, Harpreet, actually, to right. welcome the work on is the it, digital Is it me program. or? I'm here. Yeah. Oh, you're there. There. Do, you, do you want to come in? Sorry, I can see you now, Patrick. My apologies. Uh, do you want to come in on that on that point? My, my sense of all the digital uh, development that we're doing at the moment is going to continue. There's no suggestion it shouldn't. And we're very, very linked in with the transformation director, Tim Ferris, and various parts of his team. Um, so the work we're doing uh, across the whole range of things from technology enhanced learning, the use of digital technologies and the delivery of education, and the work we're doing with the Universities UK and the Council of Deans on blended learning approaches for undergraduates, all very much, for, for, I think, full steam ahead. And we're making sure the transition doesn't get in the way of those conversations and those developments. Does that answer your question, Harper? Sorry, yeah, no, <clears throat> thanks. For that. It was just more about the internal piece about the digital first programme that we're creating ah, for the sorry. internal organisation. Apologies. Yeah. So um, that that is also, uh, I see, is continuing. Uh, there's very much interest uh, with uh, our digital colleagues, and the IT uh, services uh, in NHS England. And in fact, as the work I'm leading on corporate services transition, we're using the digital first uh, process in terms of user engagement and user-centred uh, delivery um, to actually show our colleagues in NHS England what we've got at this side that we can bring across. And there's a lot of interest in that work and how we're delivering it. Thank you. Sorry, David, I lost my connection then. I've come back now. Um, uh, Harpreet, I think that's a really important uh, point about the, the digital first uh, work that we've done because it was very internally focused about how we do our business and making sure that you know we were an efficient effective organization in that space um, we are sharing that information with our colleagues in in um, NHS England and as pa as Patrick pointed out there is there isn't a similar program there isn't a similar program in NHS England so the task will be at what stage in the new organization uh, we could implement something like this in the kind of in the in the coordinated way that we have done and how do we make sure we don't lose the progress that we made uh in the last couple of years um in joining so it is on the operational delivery kind of um uh work and patrick is leading 
uh, on 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 the formation of the new sort of corporate function for the new NHS England. So we hope that we will land this for early um, uptake. Very good. Great. Thank you. Are you okay with that, Harper? Yeah. Yeah. yeah perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so can I just offer congratulations, Navina, to you and the team and um, their teams for the positive performance that is reported in your report on the GP numbers, nurse numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that is um, very positive. I just echo your congratulations to Wendy for uh, the Royal College of Physicians recognition. Um, that's tremendous news. Uh, very pleased to hear that. And um, I, again, I just want to echo the importance of the digital first work um, as we begin to um, progress. Uh, Mark and um, I met the University's Alliance on uh, Monday of this week, and it was interesting. A lot of that conversation was about the role that technology is playing in the development of healthcare, but also in the delivery of education as well. So um, I think this is an agenda that um, we do need to pay attention to as we go forward. So um, thank you for that. Um, so let's um, go on to um, the reports from committee chairs. Um, board. Let me, um, I'm not sure what order they're coming in. Um, so under, under, order are they? Nicholas. A, a performance and Business Committee. And Andrew isn't here, but there's a written report there. Does any, David F, do you want to come in on this one? Yeah, it's, um, ju just a couple of points. We obviously um, had focus in the meeting on um, cancer and diagnostics. We did a deep dive to understand both the challenges that they faced um, as a diagnostic part of the programme's grown and some of the challenges in particular about workforce. We got a good sense of the size and shape of the workforce, new entry routes in particular around the apprenticeship um, progression um, and the, the how the budgets have increased to, to deliver um, some of the challenging targets that we've got. Um, I think it was a very good presentation um, that was shared after, and I think it sort of set a standard for how we'd like to do deep dives in, in the future. Um, we also had a focus on quarter two performance, which we've just touched on in particular on nursing, GPs, and again, cancer and mental health, um, pretty much being on, on trajectory for the majority of the targets um, that we have. And we had a, um, a two other discussions, one around finance and um, starting to think around year end um, turnout position, what that may be. Um, and we have also a discussion around legacy. So given that um, quarter four performance finishes at the end of March and is usually reported in quarter one. Um, so trying to work through what happens with that and how it gets integrated into the, the annual report and the counts um, post cessation of HU. Um, and we've also started to pick up now um, the BAF just to make sure that any risks within the board assurance framework that are under the um, auspices of the performance business committee are measured appropriately and that we are in a position to make a recommendation of which one should be closed and which should be transferred to the new organisation. So thank you, David. Those are the main issues. Thanks, very good. Anybody wants to come back to David on, on any of that? OK, all right, thank you. Uh, Andrew F, um, People and Culture Committee from October. Um, well, I don't propose to go through the October meeting, but if I could just give a very quick update on the December meeting, which was yesterday, so we, we haven't got a written report on it. But um, there, there were really three main items discussed yesterday. Um, one was the arrangements for transition, which we're going to talk about again at this meeting. The second was a, an update on equality and diversity um, within HEE. Uh, and this reported many, many great positives, many initiatives that are happening regionally, nationally, and are very encouraging. But it also reported that the, the RES data shows that the, the prospect of a white person being appointed to a vacancy is 1.68 times higher than somebody from a BME background 
Uh, and the comparison is even more stark when you compare people with disabilities. So despite all the progress, um, the actual results when it comes to making appointments is, is still making very slow progress. And then we put these two together, the transition and the appointments process, and we can see a very significant risk looming um, starting from sort of March and going on to September next year that the broadly 18,000 staff across HEE, NHSE and NHS Digital, 18,000 staff, um, there is a extremely significant risk if we do nothing that there will be a, a non-appointment and the do nothing calculation is that something like 650 um, BME staff will not be appointed when they are in fact the best candidate. Now that's a statistical comment rather than a qualitative comment. So a lot of the discussion, was excellent discussion yesterday, was about the work that is already in place to try and improve that process uh, and asking for the, the team under Vicky to come back at the February meeting of the People Committee with as convincing a case as they can for how this process is going to be much, much fairer and is going to uh, remove as in as far as possible those unequal chances of appointments. Thanks, Andrew. Anybody want to come back on any of that? Uh, Rob, I wonder whether your team um, might help Vicky's teams just do some of that analysis um, that's required. I, I'd uh, welcome um, uh, some further analysis uh, of, of some of the data that the Equalities team are driving, actually, um, uh, uh, as well. So um, if, if um, you could spur somebody to do um, some support to Vicky's team uh, and the EDI team, that would be very helpful. Yeah, so Helen Mansfield's team already um, do quite a lot of work, but if there's specific work which would help us clarify the kind of issues that Andrew is raising, then of course we're happy to do it. The paradox here in my mind is that we've, we're actually employing more people who are Black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds in numerical terms, but we've got more applicants coming from those backgrounds as well. So in the way the calculations are done, and I'd just like a richer understanding of that. And I think some of your guys will probably isolate some of the variables there and actually be clearer about what's the correlation, what's the driver, et cetera. And that's what I think will be very uh, helpful. Um, um, but l let's not try and have the conversation here. I think it just needs somebody who knows what they're doing when it comes to uh, analytics to actually sit down and um, and do some further work. Uh, Joe, you want to come in? Yeah, just to say, so it's, it's we do need to do the analytics, but I think also now we need to build it into the transition process because my experience is that anecdotally that every merge I've been in, I think, has resulted in, in a less diverse workforce, particularly at senior positions. And so I think when we maybe come on to our transition conversation, think about how we're factoring in assurances as we develop the JDs and the processes that we're actively trying to mitigate against that risk and how we assure ourselves as we go forward that actually we uh, uh, at least maintain and hopefully improve the diversity rather than make it worse. So I just think there's something within our system where the gravity goes the other way. So we need to do something counterfactual to stop history repeating itself. With my person, if you said that's a strategic policy issue, it's not just about the analytics, and we need to build that in now, would be my advice. I think the key challenge, and we need to come back on all of this, but um, if you have ring fences to make the progression, then I don't know how you can improve the diversity in the more senior levels where you've got ring fences. The only way you can do that is by not filling those posts and then going out to advertise them. So I think your point about not making it any worse is absolutely right. But if I've understood the ring fences, I'm not sure how we can make it better at this current time uh, and the way that ring fences are going to work. But that is still not agreed, I think. Um, the, the HR processes are still subject to discussion, as I understand it. I'm not arguing for ring fences, David. I think if, if you look at the analysis, I know there's no more that it's me, but I know we've done it for sort of looking at applications to psychology places where you know, there are key points where you can see 
uh, diverse candidates dropping out and that's that's uh, both the criteria of putting those initial JDs asking for certain qualifications the process of interviews you can see there are points at which we lose people so it may be that we can link with with, with Rob on that but um, let's I just want to make the let's point that we need to look at it now let's, yeah let's do the analysis Soraya please um, thank you, Sir David. I think just to add that the other richness of our conversation yesterday was around the support that is going in for staff during transition. Um, and I just really would encourage, and we, we discussed this yesterday, that the team really needs to make sure that people take those opportunities on and they actually avail themselves of getting the support because it's great we're doing all of that, but there is a, there is a real importance um, and when you look at a parallel, even with gender, you will have, unless this is su supported in a positive way and say women are encouraged to apply for certain positions of seniority, it is only then you start to make that shift. So I really would suggest that the team focus through perhaps the networks and through some of our ambassadors that we've got on inclusion, um, that people are really going to take the, that support up. Thanks, Soraya. As, as, um, I, I, I endorse just how much work has gone into the support offer to staff. I thought it was a tremendous um, um, piece of work and a tremendous list that has been put together by Vicky and her team. So um, uh, you're right to pull out just uh, what a positive discussion it was yesterday, Soraya. Thank you. Um, can we go on then to John and um, the audit committee? Yeah, sorry, I'm late joining, but um, just so you know, like everybody else, there are a lot of the focus at the moment is is on transition, and and really, I think that the challenge, and we've got a, a meeting coming up this week for, of the audit committee, and we've got Miranda Carter coming from uh, NHSE, and um, the real question, of course, is around: Are we managing all the risks? Are we managing everything? Is the transition going to happen? And are they ready to catch everything? that we will end up transitioning to them in terms of our approach and what we're doing. And I think the one of the big focuses of the meeting this week, which builds on some of the conversations from the, the, the meeting that we last had, which is about assuring ourselves that the handover will be as smooth as possible. We won't drop the ball in all of the areas that we're looking at, you know, everything from legal cases over to um, managing the risk around workforce planning and ensuring, and, and this was a conversation I had with a couple of the, the other audit chairs, if you like, during the transition, and uh, NHSD in particular has got some challenges that, that they've seen in terms of transitioning across, is making sure that we are able to communicate what we perceived as our risks and what we had within the way in which we operated, compared to what the, um, the receiving entity we'll see as, as how it wants to pick up those risks and, and deliver them in the future. So I think there's a lot of work that's been going on <laughs> in that space to make sure that there is no ball that's dropped um, as we go into the transition period and that things are as tidy and as clean as possible and as concluded as possible, including everything from internal audit reports and everything else that we are progressing on. Um, to make it as, as tidy a transition as possible, but but it's not it's not that easy because not everything, as as we know, is sorted yet, um, and I'm not too sure that NHSE knows what it's going to get from us in its entirety as we get to the end of the uh, process. So I think that's the area where, if anything, we need to uh, particularly focus on historically in terms of the meeting that we had, normal stuff, internal audit reports, progress is fine. Um, our relationship is fine, what we're doing there, um, all sorts of things like the new protocol that we have to bring into place about sharing internal audit reports across with the Treasury and everything else. So I think you know the, the, the comment would be the business as usual is going fine, no real problems, nothing in particular to worry about um, and, and nothing that's particularly difficult. Um, but it's that transition period of making sure nothing gets dropped between now and when we finally do transition everything over and anything, any of the legacy stuff, which I must admit, when I was involved with doing this with Innovate and UKRI, a number of balls did get dropped. And uh, when they appeared on the other side, there was a, there was a bit of horror, not because um, the, uh, it was, they were particularly difficult to deal with, it was just there was no institutional memory left, uh, which enabled them to answer the question, really. 
Uh, very good, John. Thank you. Anybody want to come back to John on any of the? No. OK, so um, last and definitely not least, uh, hi, Preet, on the College Committee. Thanks, David. Just uh, it's, it's uh, obviously in the papers, but just two things I wanted to uh, highlight. One was the update on the quality in education and training designing for new NHS England work that's been ongoing and we're working uh, with that with Wendy obviously leading that and colleagues but th that was something we discussed in terms of the national approach but also some of the regions and and how the you know the different uh, kind of standards and different lens required to map that so, so where that's an ongoing piece of work um, and, and we will continue and I think we'll have a discussion on that in the transition uh, item that we have later today and then the second one was really an update from David and the team that we received on the Ockerden work in terms of the quality improvement programs and, and what's happening from that front and again an agenda item on today's board um, but we've also asked for a um, progress report back in February, so we'll get a sense of that. So those were kind of the two key things that have been ongoing in terms of the quality committee. OK, thanks, RP. Wendy? i just add one thing, that we had the uh, first uh, reports from this year's NET survey. As you know, it's the only healthcare survey that looks at all undergraduate students and those postgraduate training posts that we fund. Um, and we've uh, had the biggest response ever, which is really great, given the, the sense of morale out there. Um, the team are analysing the data now, um, but in terms of our colleagues in ICBs and in providers, they'll be able to look right down at their own local area, compare themselves. Um, and I think the data is going to be really helpful for us as we go into the next stage of the merger. Uh, so we'll bring that at some stage to, well, we'll have it certainly for the next quality committee, we'll, we'll share it with whoever wants to see it as it gets published. Thanks, Wendy. OK, all right, let's let's um, let's move on. So um, thank you, colleagues, for those report back. I um, didn't get to all of those meetings, but I got to the majority of them. And I, I, um, so um, I do have a feel for the meetings and um, I, I have to say, to Soraya's earlier point, I think the discussions taking place are very rich uh, indeed, so thank you. Um, so let's move on to um, the transition to the new organisation. This is a transition update. You'll note that we've got an item on the private board later uh, this morning as well, and I, and I guess um, that gives an opportunity for us to consider some of the more sensitive uh, issues at the minute, which would be seen as confidential, um, as distinct from this report, which I think is a report on progress and where we're up to. And um, just to um, uh, try and differentiate between um, the public board meeting and the private board meeting later this morning. But um, Philippa, over to you, please. Thank you, um, to David, and, and morning, everyone. Um, so um, for people who, who don't know me, because I'm aware this is a public board meeting, I'm Philippa Spicer, and I'm leading the transition work on behalf of Navina. So you've got in front of you a paper that outlines the main um, components of the programme. Um, as I, I came in at the end of that previous conversation, we have different aspects from due diligence, day one readiness, um, through to design and transfer um, over in uh, beginning of April. So I'll just um, very briefly um, talk about the summary and then I'm happy to answer any questions, David. Is that, is that OK? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, you'll see that we've, um, we're have we completing the due diligence work, um, um, baselining for people, culture and OD workstream for HEE. I think we're confident now that we have um, an agreed baseline um, there's been a lot of work and thanks to the to the HR um, team for supporting that. That is now being um, kind of we're saying kind of locked in and every change being monitored now so that as we move through to transition, we're keeping that agreed baseline and making sure it's, it's updated. At the receiver information requests and there's more information in the report. Um, you'll remember that we we started this process with with our version of this, if you like, due diligence, very clear program of capturing all of the information from how many contracts we have to um, uh, to, to staff numbers, etc. And um, and then 
recently um, NHS England have, have turned this into the receiver um, work. They are kind of both sort of different sides of the same coin. So we're trying to make sure they absolutely align. Um, and then in it, it, then that got further complicated because, of course, with um, NHS Digital joining in January, there needed to be uh, another version of day one readiness called the minimum um, um, operating model for day one readiness that will need to be in uh, working in January. So all of those things are coming together. Um, we are double checking all of our work, so our due diligence work together with obviously day one readiness, but also with our DH sponsor. So we're making sure that the list of things that that we want to make sure, you know, are covered. Is there anything we've forgotten? Absolute belt and braces on that. So um, so we're confident that we're, um, you know, that we have the list um, of information to transfer. What I would say um, in terms of transfer, we are I think we will benefit from the fact that there's a few key systems that we use that are the same as NHS England. So the payroll system's the same, for example. Um, they're confident that in terms of contracting uh, as well, it's it's not quite as blunt as if you like a cheapy transfer where we would we would have to be worrying about moving everything. So from from some of the things that would be a real risk and concern for us, actually it's not quite the same in in relation to this transfer. Um, so um, I'm just whipping through the programme. So there are some um, audits. There's an internal audit um, that's been agreed to look at how the um, transition um, programme has been um, set up and governed. Um, and that will be coming through the audit committee. Um, and then I mentioned that, I've mentioned that, I've mentioned due diligence. And then in terms of design, if I can move colleagues on to design, um, we are we have had a number of design authority meetings since we last met. Um, we have another one on Friday, at which point we we are um, uh, hoping to sign the majority of the national function um, off, um, which enables us to still meet the deadline of going out to consult um, at the beginning of February. So there's a huge amount of work being done. Um, and again, thanks to design leads across the organisation um, uh, and that including obviously people, director, colleagues. So we we have we believe we've made really, really good progress. We had a design meeting on Monday that, that was reasonably positive. So design authority meeting. Um, so I think, David, I'm going to pause there. Um, there's a lot of detail in that report and I'm happy to pick up any questions. Thank you uh, very much, Philippa. Um, Navina, do you want to add anything to um, Philippa's report and uh, comments? Well, I only want to say thank you to Philippa and the team, and then also all the people like in our HR team and, you know, uh, the people who've been contributing to gathering the information and colleagues here in the exec as well. Uh, David, for all of our NHS uh, sorry, all of our AGE colleagues and NHS England colleagues, everybody's future is uncertain. And yet the professionalism uh, and commitment to try and get this right is, is well, I want, I want it's commendable. Yeah, no, Thank I, I you. completely agree with that. I completely agree with that. Um, so questions for, questions, comments for Philippa, please. No. Um, Philippa, Andrew Foster and myself were speaking earlier this week about um, the request that I think has been made that each committee um, uh, does a final report of its work that then goes in. And um, we raised this uh, at the People Committee yesterday and um, uh, Indy uh, uh, kindly arranged for Shamila to uh, drop a note, which she did uh, yesterday evening. Um, could you just say something about what the committees of the board are expected to do? And then I don't know, Andrew, whether you want to come back on any of that, but let, let's just make that um, transparent at, during this meeting about what the expectations are. I think it's part of that due diligence point that you were making. But um, uh, what what can you share with us, uh, Philippa, about um, about that issue? 
yeah so there's 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 two things to that so when we are closing down and I think we need to not forget that we're closing down it's not just about transfer so what we need to do is to make sure we've got a record of if you like our legacy documents and our, our kind of position at the end of um, March um, 31st although I think the, the transfer date um, might be second or third or something of April but whatever the date is we must make sure we have a um, a recall a record of um, of all of our kind of um, committees, our work, our audit um, in kind of a legacy document that we can refer back to so that if there's any challenge in the future. The second thing I think that why it's important for us to think about that is also to map against where outstanding items will go in the new NHS England governance framework. So which committees things need to be handed over to and to make sure we've we clarified kind of you know what what the issues are what the purpose is, why it needs to continue so I think it they're, they're, they're again two parts of that of that same position but um when I've worked in programs where we've closed down organizations before it's really really important to make sure we have a detailed a detailed kind of close point um that we would have called a, a legacy kind of you know document um for each area and it will go beyond committees um David, we will make sure that wherever there are areas that need to be locked down as a legacy, we will have that as a record um, archived properly. Andrew, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, we, this issue arose both at the Quality Committee on Monday and at the People Committee yesterday, and it will obviously arise at every committee that comes along. And, and at one level, it's pretty clear that we'd want to hand over an up-to-date BAF, uh, Board Assurance Framework document, with the, re with the relevant committee section brought up to date. The question really is, what do we do beyond that? I mean, you know, we could write a book or we could write a one-page document, and I guess we'd want to be quite consistent across all the committees. So I guess that what we're looking for is something like maybe a template of some sort or a set yeah, of Yeah, headings. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Really good point, Andrew. We'll go away because the uh, transformation director will be doing the same. So we'll we'll make sure there's a consistent one across all incoming. Thank you. Sorry, Nicola. Um, um, just to, to respond to Andrew's point, we do have that in hand with the accounting officer assurance handover arrangements and the appendices that will go in that detail in the work of each of the committees. Uh, Andrew Morris. Thanks, David. Um, just, just one point around assurance at the end of all of this. Who is going to review that this um, merger has been a success? I mean, I'm assuming that DH will want to do something. So we picked up earlier in this meeting that the issue of EDI and you know that that's going to be one one centerpiece that I think our staff will look look back and you know test us on in terms of you know have have we done this successfully? And I'm just thinking, will is there some 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 sort of process that will you know give some sort of judgment on whether this has been a success or not? Do you want to bring Giles in? He put his hand up very quickly. I don't know if Giles has got an answer or if you want me to. No, no, let, let, let Giles go, Philippa. Um, yeah, I was going to make one other point, but I, I, I mean, the, the, the simple answer to Andrew's question is obviously there are public bodies who, who may do this, though it's not for certain. I mean, it's quite possible that the Health Select Committee may inquire into that. Equally, the Public Accounts Committee may, may do so, um, though we don't necessarily control that. Um, but those, those would be the obvious external routes to look. I would expect, um, I mean, I shouldn't speak for NHS England, Sir David, but uh, it is possible that, that the non-executives on that board may also wish to uh, to ask for a, a review. Those would be the obvious ways, but colleagues may have other 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 ways. I had one point on communications I was going to mention, but I'll, I'll save that if you want to deal with Andrew's question. Well, it Keith, uh, Keith Wright, you're on the call. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I presume given that the initiative was a DH one, will there be any evaluation by DH colleagues in relation to this? I think the trickiness of this is at what point do you evaluate success? Um, 
six months, 12 months, two years, five years. Uh, it's a really tricky um, yeah, I, contact, I, I think. I think it is a, a tricky question. I mean, um, I'm, at the moment, they're doing, oh, there's plans for a um, triannual, you know, the old, old triannual ALB reviews. So there's one planned for a couple of years time of NHS England, which will include looking at the governance, which will have to include how well embedded yeah. um, the, the transferred functions have actually been and whether the governance and accountability arrangements are good enough for want of a better, better phrase. Okay. Um, but I'm not aware of anything other than that. But I'll certainly uh, pick it up and uh, talk talk to colleagues because um, I think one of the other things is I mean we'll certainly want to have like a an end of an end end of the year accountability meeting and stuff like that, which isn't the same as a formal evaluation, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well. <clears throat> If we can plant the seed with you, Keith, as a consequence of uh, Andrew's question, that would be helpful. And I think the um, uh, options that you pointed out uh, are all available, but it'd be um, it'd be worth pursuing this subsequently uh, about how this is uh, going to be evaluated. Um, and Giles is also right about um, different forms of accountability to Parliament, and they may wish to ask questions uh, in relation to um the transition uh joe and callum do you want to come in on this issue i do if that's okay it's a very quick yeah. point but just to, just a to flag to the board um something we've discussed with the nao and keith you may i'm hoping you might have heard of this already but is is actually we just uh, we do need a formal uh decision to be taken around in terms of the final annual report and account who actually responsible for overseeing that will it be nhs england or would it be the department of health as our sponsor so um, that's quite an important part of the mechanics, and obviously that that is factors into this into this space. But I think the NAO are picking that one up with the department. But uh, Keith, happy to pick that one up off, offline with you. Sorry. Okay, uh, Joe, you wanted to come in on this, and then I'll come back to you, James. Yeah, sorry, yes, just just two things. One, um, I've put in the in the chat box the the um, advice and guidance on maintaining quality during transition. I'm I'm presuming that still stands as a document that. Um, Ian Cumming and I worked on for Sir Bruce Keogh for the Quality Board during the last transition around 2012. So if there isn't any updated guidance, I think that's quite a good starting point. But secondly, in terms of how we measure success, I think we spoke about this before. We talked about whether the, the board itself, all the experience, we, no one knows better than us in terms of uh, what it is what we're trying to do. Is it might be that, that we just propose some simple indicators, so as a bare minimum, we would hope to see that spending on education and training is at least maintained, certainly doesn't decrease, that we see evidence of integration between service and finance and workforce planning. To try and set out some simple indicators for what would success look like for the wider system beyond the governance issues. We could work with our stakeholders on that, because if we're not careful, it would just be about did we achieve 30 to 40 percent? What was the spend? I think trying to keep alive the purpose, the potential benefit for the system, for staff and for patients would be something that we, we need to keep that really live. Very helpful. And and there is some work in NHS England on an outline business case, which is setting out the argument for why this um, transition is taking place. Uh, I think some of the objectives from that document will be the um, uh, criteria against which we should evaluate success, quite frankly. Um, Giles, you wanted to raise a different point. Well, a small point for information, and, and I think we're indebted to, to John Latham for mentioning the point about communications with some key stakeholders about transition. Um, and it's just to let colleagues know that um, Sir David and Navina have um, written out to both Universities UK and Association of Colleges in, in the last uh, day or two um, a letter about transition and hopefully able to provide what reassurance uh, people are seeking. Uh, John's been involved in that and I've just asked that the, the final copy should get sent round to those board members who haven't seen it. Um, but I thought it might be worth putting that on, on the record since John had quite rightly raised it as a as an issue of concern. 
Thanks, Giles, and thanks for picking that up as well. Um, okay, um, any more questions for Philippa? Can we can we move on? Okay, so let's move on to Callum and the finance report. Thank you, Chair. Um, I won't say a great deal. You can see the report. This was, um, as as we heard, has, has been to the Performance and Business Committee. Um, the points I made there really were that um, I think overall the, there is some risk to, as there always is, to delivering our um, desired year-end position, which is to um, meet our come within 0.5% of uh, our expenditure budgets. Um, I think we are on track to do that. And, you know, having taken, looking at information that's come through since this report, these figures were produced, that looks to be the case. And um, my team are working very closely with uh, David Fowry, Chief, Op Chief Operating Officer and the Regional Directors, who, as you probably are aware, are taking essentially the lead role in terms of um, ensuring that we meet um, our financial objectives. So, but there is still some risk and, and as, as, as there always is, because there's significant data that's yet to go into those figures around um, intakes in the new academic year um, and taking, uh, getting the latest position on activity plans um, at this point, we would expect to see that come into the uh, Q3 numbers that we will get the other side of the new year. Um, but at the moment, yes, uh, we have rated uh, we have rated our delivery risk as amber at the moment, just to, to reflect that in the performance report. Um, but yeah, we, we we expect to get that data through. But our our overall sense is that, um, and the latest information does indicate that we should be on track to deliver to that 0.5% uh, target. Um, we'll keep a close eye on that and keep the board and um, in particular its committees um, updated on that progress in the new year because we we, we did talk about this performance business committee that um, obviously with the limited amount of time um, we've got following uh, the new year to respond, uh, we want to make sure these these figures are um, aired with with um, committees as soon as possible. So we're looking at how we can do that through um, PBC. We, we could use uh, audit committee um, if, if, if we want to do that as well so that we can pick that up early in the new year. Um, but overall, good progress from the regions in terms of meeting what they need to do. We have got some tidying up in the figures to do um, between some of the categories. Uh, and I guess the final point, which I've also highlighted in the written report, is that um, we uh, we have a funding arrangement with NHS England as well as the Department of Health uh, for our activity, and we drew down um, seventy five percent of the uh, NHS England element big, uh, uh, at the start of the year uh, because we knew there would be some uh, some of our plans needed more detailed costing, and we were hoping that we wouldn't need that additional funding. Uh, it's that has proven to be the case. So we will expect to see at Q3 uh, an income adjustment for that 25% of NHS England funding that we won't be drawing down, which creates to approximately 87 million. I'm just giving you an early heads up on that one. Um, but NHS England have been uh, well aware of our position on that for quite a while. And uh, we just need to formally adjust the um, memorandum of understanding we have with them for that income. But it's, yeah, it's it's all under control. and. Um, it's something we've seen coming for quite a while and I think it's probably a good result actually in terms of just refining those figures um, and, and uh, essentially not needing that income but it doesn't affect our delivery of anything it's not it's not an it's not an adjustment to activity plans so I think those are the key points um, but happy to take questions thank, thank you Callum uh, any questions just um on page one, under clinical, um, there's a sentence which talks about timing differences of budgets yet to be distributed. I, I don't know whether uh, you've previously briefed me on this, but we we just explain that bit. I didn't understand budgets yet to be distributed, given we're in December. 
So the so first point is the this this is uh, Q2 information. So okay. this was as at the end of okay. September. Um, okay. There are always a there's always a small number of budgets that do not get distributed until later in the year because the plans the activity plans do not become okay. clear until that stage, and that's what it relates to. Uh, but we did have a real big push this year to try and get out national program money out to regions um much earlier in the year we we have we have done that this year but i think there's still more we can do in the future um and that's a will be a point of focus for good financial management so this is the academic year versus the financial year and just how we need to do the adjustment yeah. based on the academic yeah. year rather than the financial year point yeah. yeah okay which is going to be an issue that nhs england are going to have to pick up as well isn't it that's going to change um, it's a new dynamic for nhs england yeah. absolutely it's something we're we're you know we're obviously working closely with nhse yeah finance so that they're uh, aware of those uh, those requirements yeah yeah john yeah it's just to pick up and reinforce that i think that good going back to what giles said about the letter that you're uh, sending out i think that is part of the concern that some of the sort of stakeholders have is that mismatch between our financial years and making sure there's consistency and and the handover um because you know he does understand the academic calendar and the academic year and the way in which things are funded and, and a, NHSE this is completely new territory for them so getting their head around it and ensuring that there isn't um, shall we say an interruption in funds flow in particular is is a challenge because being blunt there are a number of institutions I'll declare mine isn't one of them but there is a number of institutions where funds flow is now quite critical in this space yeah yeah okay very yeah. good Thanks, and Callum, do, do, are you looking for a decision to approve the budget movements? Do, you, do we need formally as a board to agree? Yes, budget we do do that as a matter of course. Um, I don't think there's anything here that um, particularly needs close scrutiny. Uh, but as, yes, we, are, we do request that uh, agreement as, as a matter of usual business. Okay, so there's a significant number of these are transfers from national to the regions, which picks up on the point you were making earlier. Exactly, uh, it's just that. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, colleagues, are we content to provide that approval um, that Callum's asking for in this report? If somebody, uh, Andrew Morris moved his head very perceptibly, so I'm going to take that as board agreement to um, to that. Gosh, your odd work this morning. Thank you, Harpreet. Um, Right. Um, so if we can move on, I think that comes into the performance report. David, um, David, this is yours, I think. Um, and again, this is quarter two. Uh, I, I, I make that point as much to tell myself that it's quarter two, not uh, quarter three. But uh, David, over to you. Thank you, thank you David. Um, a couple of points just to raise from the front reports. We've had a bit today already. Um, so we have 30 indicators that we assess ourselves against. Um, as of the end of quarter two, we're um, ahead of the game or we're on track for 29, not than 30. The one that's amber is the financial position at that stage. And we've just heard the updates on that area. Um, just a couple of things I thought probably worth pointing out. I think we've talked about GPs um, and confidence around the 4,000 and also the nursing figures. Um, there are still some challenges in nursing, obviously, with the um, starts um, this year. Um, and some of the um, the local intelligence we're getting around um, some of the reasons for that about the economic environment, et cetera, which is deferring some starts from this year um, to next year. Um, a couple of areas that were slightly off track to point out. One is around um, physician associates. Um, we just had one program that didn't run in the Midlands and we weren't able to um, move them students to other programs in the year. So there's about 7.5% shortage on the PA programme, but we do expect to, to catch that up into next year. Um, on cancer and diagnostics, um, we've had a slower start than we thought on apprentice starts, but that's within a context of um, growth in the upskilling pipeline and the educational programme start. So I think the overall numbers were due to be around 3,007 and we expect to hit around 3,500. So whilst one element is off track within uh, the overall programme, is doing um, pretty well and the other area that's um, exceeding slightly is on um, acps which um, target was um, 3340 and we're at 3357 at the end of this period so again a pretty good start 
Um, just given we've, we've talked quite a lot on um, the numerical targets, I thought it might just be useful to um, pull out some of the other areas that um, are continuing at, um, at pace. So in particular, um, work that's happening around the current workforce and supporting um, both elective recovery and winter planning um, within regions. And we're doing quite a lot of work on things like um, workforce toolkits for cardiology um, and developing an innovation hub for elective care recovery. And again, these things are on track um, at this stage. Um, and I think Wendy's mentioned NETS, which we've been preparing for um, increased uptake, which we've received this year. Um, so again, um, slightly above <laughs> our expectations in that area. And final one, just to point out, um, Chairman, would be that within the context we've got at the end of quarter two, we were doing pretty well against our attendance rates and our um, turnover rates, um, given the, the context and the climate that we're in. So want to keep an eye on in quarter three, reporting, but um, fairly well on track for quarter two. I think though the main notes we highlight, Chairman, and happy to take any, any questions. Very good, David, thank you. Um, so colleagues, questions, comments, observations for David? Anybody want to come back? Um, can I have a go then? So. Um, in section one, David, <clears throat> pardon me, um, paragraph 2.1, the third bullet in bold talks about the challenges for clinical numbers beginning to emerge. Um, would you just say a bit more about that and, the, uh, and particularly the scale of it? Is this something that we should be worried about given what we've just heard at the top of the meeting about nurse applications and applications to medical school. What what weight should we give to um, that third bullet point in 2.1? I, th I think um, at the moment it's local intelligence, so it's not confirmed numbers. But what we're seeing is um, to, in some areas in particular, so South East, South West, we've got anecdotal evidence around um, people who have had an ex accepted programmes um, but are declining to go on them programmes at this stage because of the economic environment and pressures. And in particular, we're seeing that on some of the programmes where you'd expect mature students, such as mental health programmes. So we don't think the numbers are significant, but they're enough to warrant us to do further investigation and keep an eye on that. And just within the context of the overall numbers, we can see sort of a 10% reduction on last year in terms of acceptances. But within the context of since 2019, since pre-COVID, a 14% increase of nurse acceptances. So the overall numbers are up compared to where we were before the COVID bounce. Um, but the, there is an impact on them numbers given the actual starts um, because of cost of living in particular that people are quoting. But we haven't got a firm number of that at this stage. Yeah, OK, really helpful. Uh, Rob? Yeah, I just want to say, Dave, this is exactly the kind of thing that um, colleagues are building into the long term workforce plan about around risk. Um, you know, the, the assumptions that we'll put forward to people that will inform our all levers actions have to include the fact that the counterfactuals will have risk of exogenous factors. Um, and one of the tricky things is to identify whether a change is a one off or a, or a causal trend type thing. So. I think that's why, you know, the critical thing here is to keep this stuff under review actively, which I'm not sure we've done adequately. Um, so yeah. that we're not surprised in five years time yeah. that people have become more part time or or or, or whatever factor has, has affected it. So for me, this is all part of turning the long term workforce planning to business as usual and tracking these things, probably not on a month by month quarterly basis because it doesn't change that quickly but at least to consciously keep track of them and ask and ask the questions that um, that you're asking, David, I think. No, it's a, a very good point about what some of this data means for what it is that we need to do, because um, our job isn't just to say, oh, that's interesting. Uh, we've got to take a judgment on it and then work out what action is required. Uh, uh, Harpreet, please. Thanks, David. Um, and David, always impressive to see when we put this in paper, all the great initiatives that we're doing and all the programs that we're pushing. I guess for me, it was just to say with all the kind of 
things that are happening with the transition and you know various things on people's mind is there an opportunity to get some of this out to our stakeholders to let them know of all the work we're doing and, and how we're delivering on our initiatives because again it's quite easy for it to get lost with all the briefings we might be doing for ministers and others but actually there's quite a significant amount of work here that's been done and it would be important that it does go out to all our key partners and uh, stakeholders so that they're aware that we are continuing delivering on what we set out to do. That's a good point actually Harpreet. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure who came in first, John or Soraya, so I'll, co I'll come to you first, Soraya, please. Um, thank you. I know um, Sir David and I think David, we're going to have a discussion um, on the government side, but just really a question. As we move forward with ICS's um, emerging, we had a very interesting case study at the Quality Committee, which picked up where HEE had to intervene on um, performance issues around trainees, etc. And I just wondered, um, are we doing any piece of work at the moment, David, in terms of performance monitoring and going forward in our relationship as we go into NHSE with um, emerging ICSs and where the accountabilities will sit? Um, because that's going to be quite critical. Well, we want to come back on that, David. Yeah, we, we are, Saray, and it, it is early days with the ICS part of it. The first stage we've got is to make sure we're moving to some sort of integrated reporting with the people directorate. So we've got the totality of anything that affects workforce, including the retention figures that we talked about at the moment. The discussion then is around um, how that works out with regions, not just up through NHS England um, and then down from regions into systems. So part of this is working through the structural issues and how it works. Partly it's the resource issue to make sure there's capability everywhere, but the um, direction of travel has got to be with buying through the regions with systems um, with an ICS lens on everything we do. So that's the ambition and intention. Don't think we're quite there yet, but um, we've started. Thanks. Uh, John? Yes, yeah, just to pick up really on the on the conversation around do we get worried about the number of applicants we've got compared to the number of people who in, enroll on programmes. Uh, I think it's it's really important that we, we keep a real strong focus on enrolments. Um, there are certain areas, certain courses that we're we're running, you know, historically for us, nursing, for example, has got 15 applicants to every place that we can we can take them on. Uh, and at the moment for us, it's down to about 12 to one. Um, so the number of applications are down, but actually we're still not going to be able to take any more um, students. You know, we think we'll hit our enrolment numbers. So I think it's it's making sure that we we actually measure and focus really hard on on the hard outcome, which is the number of individuals we get on programmes. And then of course the the question is around continuation: how many people stay on those programmes um, and and actually complete. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's that sort of start and end of the programme that really are the, the challenges, I think, for us. Yeah. And what we are seeing is some people, which does, you know, reinforce what David's saying, is some people who are on programme are having some cost of living issues, which might mean that they might not maintain themselves on the programme. And, and to a certain extent, that's a real shame because, you know, you've already got people who are part way through their process. Um, of becoming qualified and then and then dropping out and that that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> uh, John, thank you. Uh, it's very helpful to have that. But uh, I think David's point, you know, many of the people going for mental health nursing are mature students. And actually, if you've got um, a mortgage and say two kids and you're retraining, then that's a big financial hit at the time of the cost of living. But um, I completely agree with your um, basic premise that the key issue is how many people start the course and how many people leave the course and go into the workforce. Um, yeah. Um, anybody else want to come in? No, David, there was also um, pages that I've got are not numbered actually, but on the um, paragraph that's headed continue to deliver the long term plan and cancer and diagnostics forgive me if you've already made this point but could you could you just uh, um, explain the last sentence um of 
of the substantive paragraph there that um, that says in some cases local demand not reflecting national assumptions made at the planning stage is being offered as um, one of the reasons why there's a risk to the training of healthcare science and apprenticeships um, and the difference between the original plan and where we are. We just say a bit more about what that dynamic is, because it, it's not unrelated, I think, to Soraya's point about the role of ICBs and local workforce plans. I think I think where people have, have heard the vision for, for example, comes from diagnostics and the potential new entry routes, in particular the range of apprenticeships. There's a lot of um, ambition to um, take them routes up, and people can see where they will fit. I think there's then, so they put the numbers in based on um, that, that future ambition over um, three to five years, not necessarily for tomorrow. I think what we've seen then is the practical reality of what you need to support this in terms of developing the supervisory capacity, the release of staff, and what we're finding is it takes longer to get that trajectory up and running than originally um, expected. So I think while we expect the numbers to go up over time, it's slower than we originally predicted. So I think in the numbers for apprenticeships overall, I think that the target was around 1,000, just over 1,000, and we expect to get up to about 850. So it's about 30% less than we'd expect, but we do think it will catch up for probably next year and not in this year, which is what the plan was based on. Okay, okay, that's helpful. And 2.4, paragraph 2.4, um, the last bullet point, uh, in the first section of that talks about levels two, three and five apprenticeships have achieved ministerial sign off and are relaunching in the autumn. Could you just say a little bit about what that actually means? Uh, less about the ministerial sign off and what is it we are launching in the autumn? Probably need to refer to Wendy actually to pick up on this one who's linked into the medical world. The medical <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're um yes, this is the uh medical undergraduate apprenticeship program, which um we've now got approval uh through all of the regulatory pieces okay. of work okay. and uh we're launching that in twenty twenty three. Yeah. Okay. Uh th this coming autumn. So it's really, really very exciting. Um we'll bring a full report back to uh, probably actually the March board will be when we've got the first uh figures for where. OK, uh, tremendous. I'm really pleased to see this. Um, uh, I should have worked that out from the paragraph that you'd written, David, but I didn't, so apologies. Um, jo. Hi, yeah, just to want to leave this section without p picking up on the point that Rob's made, which is that um, we, it, we, we've now got 3,000 advanced clinical practitioners um, in the system. And looking back at 2014, we had less than 1,000, so we've trebled that workforce. And it just reminded me, all the work that you and others did, actually Naveena back in the day, on the people plan. If you remember as a system, we worked together with NHS England and ourselves, I think it was NHS and Proops, a trilateral, uh, to agree, given the limited investment we had, to focus on cancer, mental health and advanced clinical practitioners, with the ACPs being about reform as well as growth. So we agreed that as a system, we got the investment forward. It shows that with, with, the, with the agreement between service planning, what service needs and the workforce needs to deliver and the investments to deliver it, we can do what we say we will do. So I just think it's a really good example. Doesn't mean it's enough. Grow, you know, uh, supply is growing, but demand is growing probably even faster. But I think it's a really good example of what we can do as a system when we work together. Really important point, Joel. And um, I do think um, advanced practice is one way of keeping people in the workforce um, because it gives them a, um, a career stretch in a sense. And um, uh, actually, the generation of more autonomous practitioners that are able to make decisions, I think, is absolutely what we require. And, and um, how they form part of the skill mix that we require going forward, I think, is is hugely, hugely important. So um, a really important point. Um, any more for David uh, and the performance report? No? OK, so. Um, I haven't been notified of any um, other business, so um, unless anybody wants to raise anything. No, no. Um, 
Well, I think that brings us to the end of the public board meeting. So colleagues, thank you um, for your attendance contribution. Thanks to uh, those that prepared reports and presented them. Um, let, let's draw the meeting to a close. I think we reconvene in, um, what is it, um, 35 minutes at um, 11.30, I think it is, isn't it, um, for our um, uh, private board meeting. And um, uh, so I look forward to seeing you um, at 11, 11.30. Okay, thanks everybody.